actually on a, um, an alert weather day, but it's looking really nice right now. I'm Mary Margaret White. I'm the CEO at Mississippi Today. I'm very proud, very humbled to be working with the great team that we have at Mississippi Today and super excited to see all of you out this morning for the first in three series uh, that we're calling Mississippi in the Know. It's a series of legislative breakfasts host here um, at Basil's downtown. So again, thank you for joining us. This event is designed to be a lot like Mississippi Today accessible, informative, and intelligent. And we hope that you um, get a lot out of the conversation this morning. And we're just really glad to be convening in person again. Um, but we also want to welcome um, all of the people that we have um, joining us through Facebook Live and through live stream this morning. So we welcome you uh, into this space with us here in downtown Jackson. This event is made possible today by our sponsor, AARP. We are so grateful for their support. Now, you may notice um, to my left over here, we've got Marshall Ramsey, editor-in-large at Mississippi Today. Marshall is going to be capturing the conversation this morning, as only Marshall Ramsey can do. So uh, whenever you're ready to see a little sneak peek of Marshall's drawing, you know, send him a message, give him a nod or a flag, and uh, you can see the work in progress. But we'll be sure to share um, an image at the end of our conversation today. Now, I am super excited and grateful to welcome Mississippi's 33rd Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman, uh, in our conversation today with Editor-in-Chief Adam Ganeshow. I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Governor, uh, I immediately realize how difficult it is being on this side of the cartoon uh, process <laughs> for Marshall Ramsey. It's a I got, I got a whole wall. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing. Every every politician's office I've ever been into in Jackson and Washington seems to have at least one Marshall Ramsey framed uh, original on the wall. So really, really do appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for being here. This is uh, just uh, a pleasure talking with you. It's it's going to be a good conversation. And I think, uh, you know, could, could talk with you about any number of things for any number of hours. But you, you have a schedule. We have a schedule. And uh, thinking about what possibly could be most important to spend our time discussing this morning uh, is, I think, the historic amount of revenue that Mississippi has to spend on really anything it wants right now. I mean, you have been uh, out in front on this issue. Uh, I think it's something like, what, $1.9 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act and then close to $2 billion in just state surplus revenue. So. You're looking at a pot of almost $4 billion to spend, which is, um, as far as anyone can tell, the most money we've ever had at one time to spend. Uh, like I said, you've been out in front in discussing how to spend that money. Uh, you have sort of you know, met with experts along the way, and, and you've talked a lot about it. I think before we get started, I'm hoping that you, for us, can just contextualize this moment, help us understand what's really at stake here with this massive amount of money that y'all have to spend and and what would you like to see uh, done with it yeah it, it is a uh, a blessing and a burden as mom used to say and we we do face some interesting parts here and we when we learned that the uh, federal government was going to shower mississippi with about five billion dollars worth of, of revenue 1.8 billion comes to us comes to the legislature 1.6 billion went to the education community 900 million went to the cities and counties. And then there were other funds uh, that helped mental health and some other, other issues. But it's a tremendous amount of money. And, and then you're right, we doubled that, our share of it, by having phenomenal rates of return. Uh, we made a billion dollars over budget last year. And uh, that came from a year, some of that came from the fact a year before we'd had to cut the budget. So we cut the budget and then when this rainfall hit us from the federal government, nobody anticipated we'd make a billion dollars more than revenue. So we, we had that. And then this year, we're running about $600 million over. We're running about a million dollars uh, a month over uh, our what we thought was budget. So we it was a staggering time. And as this sinks in and you realize where, where you are in this place and time in Mississippi's history, you realize that this is a one-time matter. 
uh, we'll never have this again. So with that, about a year ago, seeing this occur, I, I started going out and meeting uh, particularly with members of the Board of Supervisors, uh, cities and whatnot, and we, we attempted to establish with them that we would match their money. So I was going to take their 900 million, take 900 million from the half of our money, the money that came to the legislature, and match that. So all of my cities and counties would have roughly $1.8 billion to fix infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, sewer, uh, tourism, uh, broadband, everything that we need and have said we're needing that we're, and that we're lacking on in a lot of areas, this is an opportunity to have it. And uh, I've had great responses from the supervisors and from the cities and whatnot. I've received hundreds of proposals from all over Mississippi. I have categorized those every day, every, uh, virtually every day I get one in from town, small towns around Mississippi. I put those on spreadsheets to get ready for uh, the final decisions made by the Mississippi legislature on how to disperse those funds. So they and it's going to vary in a whole b bunch of different ways. And so we'll get into that if you want to. I was going to ask: Is it mostly focused on infrastructure? Is that right? Or for these lo the local match program? Is do it, they have to spend on mostly infrastructure that y'all would then match? Or yeah, and that's a really good question. And when I looked at this, there are a number of needs. For example, Jackson gave uh, their first responders a big pay raise. That's not transformational. Needed. It's not transformational. This money that we got, I want it to be longer than one or two years. I want it to be one and two decades. So what we told them was, we're not going to match your pay raise. That's really necessary. You make that decision. But if you make a decision to put something in the ground for the next 20 years, we'll match that. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily the correct decision or not, but I felt really strongly that we didn't wake up a year or two from now, find ourselves that we had raised people's compensation and we don't have the money to pay it anymore. So we come back and we cut them. That, that is, to me, just myopic of the first order. So I wanted to go for longer term things. And each one of these cities are making those decisions right now under the political pressure to fix their police salaries maybe and they really need a new water tank in the south of the city. And so they're balancing those and I'm encouraging them to take the long-term view. It, it is a tough balance, as we've heard. So Mississippi Today, if y'all haven't seen this, we have uh, this pretty comprehensive project we're calling Follow the Money. Uh, it's a newsroom-wide effort where every single reporter in the room, no matter what they cover, has touched it. And we've talked to a lot of people. I mean, not, not as many as you. I think you've been to more than, what, 50, 60 counties yeah, I have. in the last few months yeah. talking to local yeah. officials. But there's, there's an interesting balance that they're all having to strike, like you said between, you know, this this is technically a pandemic stimulus package, right? It, it is meant to sort of, uh, you know, compensate for lost revenue or lost expenses or expenditures, whatever, during the pandemic. But, as you've said, this is a very unique moment, once in a lifetime, perhaps, moment in Mississippi, a state with so many needs. How, are they asking you for advice there? Are these local government officials coming well, to you and asking uh, how to navigate those waters? To some degrees. I've had meetings like with Tippa County and their board of supervisors. We met an hour last week, and we do a lot of this by Zoom for, so they don't have to travel and whatnot. And, and they wanted to get into that particular part of it. Um, something that's helped me since we did the first decision to try to do long term was that all the cities and counties are getting more money. They're experiencing the same thing we do. They get 18% of the state's funds and their, their, their local economies are booming and whatnot. So they're able to cover these local expenses like raises for policemen and whatnot. They're, they're able to cover those without having to dip into this money, you know, uh, into the American Rescue Plan money. So I'm hopeful that they'll balance that. Now, the cities that make other decisions, I can't say that that's wrong. It, to me, it's just short-sighted. I mean, certainly there are a lot of necessities. In, uh, in some of these places, you see that the compensation for a police officer is barely minimum wage. We, we've seen some of that. I think just yesterday, our reporter, Kate Royals, uh, wrote a story about uh, child abuse services centers across the state mm -hmm. that have lost a lot of federal funding. I think their federal funding, which was a majority of their uh, revenue, was cut in half in the last year. So. Yeah, we'll fix that this year, the vocal funding we're going back. 
Um, that's one of the brighter spots. I don't know if you want to get into mental health and child protective services or not. If, this, if that where it leads you, I'm happy to talk sure. about it. Sure. Well, in um, about a few months ago, we I went to the trial for the mental health. And in it, there was a, an expert that the Justice Department had brought down here. And um, we lined up in, in the trial room, and they all over there with their blue suits on and everything. And I was sitting there, and, that, and the court stopped and said, Judge Reeves stopped, and I said, we're so pleased to have the lieutenant governor here. Um, I've ne you've never been in my courtroom. And so I thanked him and said, I hoped I would never be there again. And uh, we ended up settling with a monitor to work out our, the lawsuit against us on mental health. And we are taking significant amounts of money out of this budget and out of the American Rescue Plan to fix mental health so that we don't have somebody dictate to us on amount of money that's absorbent. We, we're, we're dealing a lot with that. Child Protective Services, we have no place to place children in, in our public property. So we're relying on the mansion and the Palmer home and all these others. So you'll see significant money going to bolster up our Child Protective Services. Uh, we have about a 33% turnover in the ladies and men that work with these young children, and we have about 5,000 of them in our care right now. So it was a big thing for us to devote significant money. And you'll see in the split of the ARP, uh, almost a little less than $100 million going to Child Protective Services and getting that up to something that we can, we are under a court order, of course, but we'll get out from under that court order, but we need to do the right thing whether we had a court order or not. So there's a lot of moving parts to this, not just the uh, water and sewer part. Sure, sure. So it, it sounds like striking that balance between sort of short-term or almost retroactive needs, I mean, in some mm -hmm. cases, like these child abuse centers, we've heard a lot from nurses and hospital leaders about sort of the, the nursing shortage across the state. We've, we've been all over that as a newsroom, too. And, you know, I, I don't know what the balance is, but it, it's certainly, there are so many needs. I mean, we could sit here and list a bullet point, bullet yeah. list of needs. On nursing, um, I went to the University of Mississippi Nursing, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, Mary Graham runs one down there, just does a really good job. And I started looking at how long it takes to do this and what the expenses are. And both the House and the Senate are of a, of a mind to do a nurse retention program, which will be basically about $1,000 a month for five months just to get their compensation up and not to use a bad term, but stop the bleeding of them leaving town so much. And then the second thing is uh, I want to do is to have a, uh, a plan that if you, we will pay for part or all of your nursing schooling if you will agree to stay in Mississippi for four to five years so that we have, an, uh, we have a fixed agreement with them. Both the speaker and I are on this particular uh, scale and, and schedule, and I think that will come this year. Uh, we have a similar plan for doctors. If you agree to stay in rural Mississippi, we pay your tuition to go to med school, and I want to do some of that at least for the next five years or so to get our nursings up to up to stuff. Sure. Uh, you mentioned the House. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, all of what, what you've said so far, I know that but just last week y'all passed this local match program was $750 million through right. the Senate. All right. Everything still has to go through the House. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about any that relationship between you and the Speaker mm -hmm. and, and Senate leaders and House leaders because ultimately none of these ideas pass if there's not some buy-in from the other side of the mm -hmm. building. Uh, tell us a little bit about the current state of your relationship with the Speaker and your Senate leaders' relationship with House leaders on specifically on how to spend this money. I mean, mm -hmm. 174 lawmakers in the building Everybody has their idea, different ideas of how to spend the money, and, and it's a fight. That's, how, that's what it is every session. But yeah. especially with this much money, those personalities and, and that uh, dynamic seems more important than ever. So tell us a little bit about the current sort of well, state of affairs there. Well, first, let me start off by getting, making the record clear. The rumors that we're doing a constitutional amendment to have a unicameral form of government, those are not true. <laughs> you know, we're not just going to have one, one legislature. Breaking news. That's there. right. It's not going to do that. But, um, you know, the speaker and I meet every Tuesday morning for a half an hour. Uh, most of those are very pleasant. Some of them are, um, I would say, as they say in the uh, farm, foreign affairs, uh, upfront and honest. Uh, so we have discussions. We, I believe, the both of us, uh, first of all, I like to speak personally. He's a good man. He's a good person. 
And so I think most of the deviations are not uh, off off the wall deviations there. Which shade of north are we going to? You know, and keeping this the, basically our state on a growth pattern. He he had he was very informative uh, and pushed so hard on sexual trafficking really before I got here. It's something that he really took the lead on. We've taken the lead on uh, teacher education on our side. So uh, there, there are things that he has more interest in and I have more interest in, but all of them, I think, uh, are clearly something in the best interest of Mississippi. Uh, we're heavily in discussions about the tax plan right now. We want, we want a more gradual relationship. Uh, they want to do away with the whole tax structure. So we'll go through that process. Uh, we're virtually even on education and things like that. Most of the rest of the things we're, we're talking about are are things that are nuances. Uh, both of us realize our state parks have collapsed and people who are out here working and making $50,000 a day with uh, a couple of kids don't have a place to go and camp or take their child fishing or anything else. So we're, we have a lot of things that we're in agreement on. Uh, I think the weekly meetings are healthy. Uh, a lot of other meetings are held in the course of the week and uh, things move around. Uh, I have um, my management style is I bring my, my committee chairman in. We have discussions about all the bills that have come there and all the bills that they want to do. We decide which ones should be prioritized. Uh, then we send them off to talk to the other side. And you're right, we have 174 people in the Capitol and we have, uh, I'd say, probably about 300 different opinions because they'll change during the day, you know, so you have to be careful about that. So it's, it's good. I think our working relationship has proven good over the last two years. It was uh, exemplary, I think, in the flag. Uh, they were very concerned not to have forced their people to have a vote on the flag unless we had our, our numbers. And so we worked together on items like that, and I think that's carried over. Do you sense that your thoughts on spending some of this federal money in particular, the, the local match, do you think that has support in the House right now? You know, I have, I've talked to a couple of members over there about that. They ask us to kind of take the lead in this AA, you know, uh, I start, start, yeah, I started to say AARP, but <laughs> they, uh, they ask us to take the lead in that. that. I know, <laughs> Speaker, he was kidding me about that yesterday. Um, I, I think um, they ask us to take the lead. We had hearings in the Senate side uh, because I come from a corporate background where we represented companies. Uh, I like the board meeting, I like hearings. We had dozens of hearings on everything from insurance to uh, tax reform at the Capitol and they're all uh, put on tape and you can watch them at night when you go home and whatnot. I think those are really, really important. Uh, I think they create uh, a, an item of discussion that ends up leading to a better legislation. So we're, we've done all of that and with that, we took the ARP, you know, took the ARP money and did, uh, Chairman, uh, I had a committee of seven people that I appointed. They came up with how we should expenditures. Those have rifled through. We've done four of the bills now. I think we'll do several more this week where we have proposed to use the money as we would propose from the hearings. They come back, they, the House did not do that, so they're kind of waiting on our proposals. I'm sure there'll be nuances and movement somewhere. Um, there will, I mean, there will have to be. Have to be, and, and certainly we will we'll entertain those. That doesn't mean that this is the best plan. It means that we had to have a start, starting point for which we say, I want to put more in mental health. I want to put less in rural uh, water. I want to put more in match. Or, you know, those things will now go on in a normal course of business. Last question about the federal spending, and I want to move on to a couple other quick things, but you talk about transformational projects, mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like, you're relying a lot on those local governments to develop those ideas, and and if if your proposal, the match proposal passes, then that will certainly do that. But from just the state legislature's perspective, from your perspective, having talked to so many of the agency heads, experts, uh, people across the state uh, about what their needs are, are there any transformational ideas that you yourself or Senate leaders plan on proposing in the next few weeks uh, before the end of this session? Not in the next few weeks, I can't think of, but I can tell you several that we are have been out in front of and will be out in front of again. Um, one, I think Mississippians should go to a full quarter system in their schools. 
nine weeks on and three weeks off. So we proposed legislation to have uh, cities, I mean, school districts be able to cover that initial cost that it takes to switch to a year-round, what they call year-round That would be year-round, so no summer break or... Well, it's or not, and, and so we have to be careful about calling it that because you go nine weeks and you're off three weeks, so obviously there's three weeks in the summer, three weeks in the fall, Christmas, and the spring. So you have four summer breaks, if you want to call it that. Um, those have now proliferating. I first started on it about three or four years ago in Corinth, and Corinth is doing exceptionally well. Their testing scores are great. Gulfport has picked this up. Other schools around here are starting to do that. Um, that needs to be in every school. And the reasons are both educational and personal. A lot of our children uh, don't have a safe place to go in the afternoon. That's just a fact. Now, how we got here or why we're here, I can't tell you that. I don't want to get into it necessarily, but we need a safe place for these people to continue their education on a scale basis. During the three-week period, uh, a lot of schools will have uh, catch-up classes. If you were behind, you can catch up. Classes you may not have been taking if you're in advanced biology or something you want to take, specialized courses. Food, safe place to be. Some of these people you leave in May and they come back late in August, they're in unsafe places and sometimes not getting fed. You can just go to schools. I've been to one in Oxford and we were filling out the backpacks for the weekend for kids that weren't going to get fed. So that social and then that structure, a continuing education structure, if you look at how we've been doing it, just because of how we harvested food and stuff, if you look at how we've been doing it, we're really in the education business with our children about seven months out of the year. So we're taking three months off during the summer or months off in Christmas and vacations. And you get, you get in the time they start in April, time to get to the test, and you end up being seven, maybe months education. So I think you will see us pushing that every single time we can to make it available for schools that want to do that and then covering the transition cost to a year-round school. Any other transformational ideas that you're anticipating this year? This yeah, we, we've looked at everything from carbon dioxide so, uh, to other things. I've asked MDOT to come back and give us our corridors for electric cars. So we will have those shortly. Uh, the regs are coming out. Uh, we will place our electric charging stations around. Uh, there's a lot of discussion and planning that needs to go for that. The, the feds, of course, want us to put them right on the interstate. We'd like to put them next to some place you can go in and shop and spend money, quite frankly. So just to be honest about it. So uh, I've asked MDOT to come with their plan. I hope to have it by the, end, uh, by the end of the session, and we will start a process of designating where our electric charging stations will be for cars. So there are there's a lot of things like that that are opening up. We're real disappointed in our forestry uh, we don't have enough mills here and so we've we've had a couple of new mills we want to propose those we have that's one of our renewable assets that we ought to be using more than we are we would hope to have at least two more forestry mills in the next year oh uh, I, I want to transition just a little bit here you mentioned it a minute ago uh, hard to talk about revenues and budgets in Mississippi without talking about the the two major income tax cut proposals that mm -hmm. are on the table one is uh, has originated from from the Senate, Senate leadership, and the other, the House. Uh, I want to start. I have some specific questions about those proposals, and I, I'm very curious to hear what you have to think, what, what you have to say about those. But the very first question I want to ask you is: Can Mississippi afford to cut the income tax right now? The short answer to that is yes, in moderation. And uh, the Senate plan that we have. Let's, let me go back for a second, because you're real smart, you can do this. The House plan wants to raise taxes 1.5%. That raises $705 million. Now, they want to take away all your income tax. That's $2 billion. Now, the difference is $1.3 billion. And the answer is we'll grow into it. Now, we might and we probably won't. So when I look at this, we have an excess right now of a billion dollars. Let's just say it's over a billion dollars right now. What do we do with that money? The Senate plan wants to give some money back to taxpayers. We want to recover a check. I mean, you send us some money, we'll send you some money back. 
The other things the Senate wants to do is lower the grocery tax because the groceries right now, inflation is really hurting people at the grocery store. The other thing we want to do is infrastructure. We want to build out the roads and bridges and water and sewer in Mississippi for the next generation, for our grandchildren. Not just use it to cover the gap between what they're raising your taxes and what they're writing off. And that basically is the difference between the two. Uh, the first one, the House plan, uh, you get a deduction the first two years, but it doesn't reduce taxes until 2032. So there's a 10-year period here, and it's kind of a misnomer to tell everybody we're going to eliminate the income tax. Not everybody will be here in 2032. So that's when it starts back under their projection. So it's about a 10-year gap there. Ours is much more immediate and also sets up the predicate. If we continue to have this kind of money, we want to return some of it to the taxpayers, and we want to build infrastructure. You haven't been shy about being openly critical of the House plan. Uh, Speaker Philip Gunn calls it uh, the most important legislation of his political career. He, he believes that about his plan. Uh, you know, they, they make the argument that the, the number, the, the $1.3 uh, billion dollar figure doesn't account for the increased revenue that we've seen this fiscal year and is projected for future ones. I don't, it's hard for me as a journalist, so hearing, you know, teachers talk about, you know, wanting a pay raise but not understanding the intricacies of the budget process, and, and that's, no one does. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. It's a complex process, but people want to know that they're going to get their money. They want pay raises in the government. They want to pay less in taxes, but they don't want that to come at the expense of basic government services. How do you, even proposing the Senate's more what I would call a more moderate version of an income tax cut. How do you assure Mississippians that they're going to continue to get the services they need at yeah. a time when, as you said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with this money that might dry up? I mean, y'all are going to spend that money over the next few years. It might not be there forever. How do you, how do you say, how do you talk to Mississippians about yeah, this? Yeah, I think it's a, it's how do you project your income? Let's say you go buy a house. Y'all go buy a house. And you can afford a house for $250,000 because you're working and your compensation level is this right now. And you decide, well, I'm going to buy a house for $500,000, double the house note. Well, how are you going to pay for it? Well, I'm anticipating I'm going to have a, get a wage increase every year and I'm going to be healthy and nothing wrong is going to go wrong. Now, if you make those assumptions, you can kind of see where you're going with the house plan. If not, those of us who recognize and remember Jimmy Carter's 20% interest? I do. Uh, do you remember after Katrina, for two years after Katrina, after the flood of money, our interest, uh, our, our economy went down 4.5%, no growth, negative? If you remember that when Haley Barber came in to office, our, our dollars and cents, our budget didn't balance? When you go back and you look at that and you want to say, look people in the eye that are Mississippi taxpayers and you say, we're going to do this in an organized way. We'll do this much this year. And uh, yeah, if, they, if everybody's right and we get $8 million, then we'll spend that money the next year. So when I tell, talk to you about a template, I can see us returning money every year. I can see us lowering the tax rate. We propose to get rid of the 4% tax rate. I can see us going along. In, in a normal common sense just as you would run your own household as this money comes in so when it doesn't which is going to happen now i can't tell you when necessarily but to me about three years out from this while this when this money has surfaced through our economy we're going to have a difficult year uh and probably a several difficult years particularly if the interest rates right. jump on us so we want to be very meticulous in assuming no significant growth, just the normal annualized growth, which is about 2%. If we do that, then I can guarantee you when I pay your, raise your teachers, I'll probably have enough money to come back next year and do it again. And when I build your roads and bridges, I'll be able to maintain them. And the things that you, that you require, um, hopefully we won't have that catastrophic event, but you need to plan like that. And we've got extra money every year we can write a check. Any given year, there's a lot of give and take between House and Senate leaders mm -hmm. on any piece of legislation, particularly that appropriates money or implements some sort of tax uh, change. 
this, you and the speaker are clearly on opposite ends of a spectrum here on the income tax cut. Uh, there's always compromise, but do you sense that there's room for compromise here? We had a good week last week. Our chairman Harkins and their chairman Trey Lamar had a series of meetings and they were trying to get the numbers right, you know, what, what really is a projection, what are you assuming? And the, and the House plan has some, what, he, what they call triggers. You know, they raise taxes, then they assume some, some assumptions, but they have a trigger that it doesn't, you know, you don't do certain things if you see the trigger. And I'll read it to you, but I, I, you probably fall off that stool trying to figure it out. But anyway, there's some stuff in there about that stuff. But there are differences that could be resolved. Uh, for example, our decrease in the uh, grocery tax is higher than theirs. Uh, their decrease in the car tax is higher than ours. Um, our elimination of the income tax is one digit. They want to do the whole digit. Uh, so there, there are rooms in here. We want to be pay back $130 million or more to people that paid the money in. They didn't put any money on a payback on a rebate. So there are some nuances in there that I think could build upon uh, a, a, a compromise agreement of some sort. The sticks in the plan for us and the sticks in the plan for theirs are very difficult. We don't want to raise anybody's taxes and we want to be very conservative in our budget re return and how we structure the tax reform. They want to eliminate tax with, with these triggers hoping to protect them from some kind of catastrophic event, and those those are the two probably where we're you know widest apart. Two pronged question for mm -hmm. you: Have you researched what's happened in other states that have eliminated the income tax? You know, thinking about the yeah. horror stories of Kansas and Louisiana, yeah. of course. And yeah. There are some better stories than that, but have you done that research? And the second yes. part of the question I want to ask you is: Do you think Mississippi? lawmakers in general or the legislature as a whole has done enough research about what these proposals would do for Mississippi? I think we have run the numbers a lot and I think we have uh, a basis for a decision. Uh, Kansas is, is Kansas. They did, they did uh, just a march to zero and then they cut the budget and then went and it collapsed. Um, other states I found that are very uh, growth oriented like North Carolina has a higher income tax than we do already. And we're cutting, we're, all of us are proposing cutting income tax. North Carolina is one of the biggest booming states they got and it's growing faster than anywhere else and it has a higher rate of tax than we got. So what it, what it brings back to us, just when you look in the mirror, in the Mississippi mirror, you have to realize that we have to have an increase in an educated workforce. Now I can make zero taxes I can give money to people coming over the Mississippi River Bridge in Vicksburg. That won't matter unless they've got somebody to work for them. Now, I probably set in hundreds of board meetings where people made decisions about where to do their work and that kind of thing. In those discussions, the rate of compensation for the employee, the ability to move your product, the cost of electricity, uh, the ability to have more than one person apply for the job, what the comparable job descriptions were and compensation was, all of those were discussed way before any tax. Taxes were important, but they did not drive people to come here. We have a 55% labor participation rate. The country has a 61. Until such time as we're able to drive an educated workforce where we can do that, the tax rate will not be the mover and shaker. The, the employee, the person, will be the mover and the shaker. Is there a situation in which you envision you and House leadership just can't get on the same page this session and it dies altogether, there's no tax cut? No, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, we, everybody has, you know, we've, we'll be passing our bill out. I saw Senator Hawkins had it the other day. We'll pass our bill out and send it down there. And I guess they'll put a bunch of red marks on it. And uh, they'll send, they send ours down and we'll put some red marks on it. But I think as long as people are, are of good heart and they're meeting, the odds are that something will work out. Um, I would hope so. People in Mississippi need a, need a tax cut. They don't need a tax increase. And they need some of their money back. And they need to, we need a stable economy. Perhaps I should have started with this question. It's just sort of a fundamental one. But yesterday, the Mississippi Economic Council released their report that uh, confirms what you were just saying about how businesses don't 
necessarily see an income tax cut as a priority. They, they have a lot of other needs that they'd like to see addressed, but that's not at the top of their list. I mean, why do we need this right now? That's, that's my question. Yeah, the, the, um, the reason for tax reduction is that we, we have a, uh, a short-term accumulation of dollars that we've never had before. So what do you do with those? And those are the political decisions. Give some money back, which we think. Reduce taxes to something that's sustainable, we think. Put money in roads and bridges and build up things in a broadband and things like that that we didn't have before. We think that's the way to go. We don't know that this is the time. You're right. The business community doesn't say anything. It's just like I just told you. I just saw that thing the other day. It's just exactly what I just said. You know, what they're interested in is a qualified workforce, electricity rates, all, all the things that businesses generate from. So uh, I think that there is a chance for us to go forward on this. I think the business community will have a big voice in this. They're the people everybody works for, and so they'll have a big voice in this. And their emphasis is on just what you said. Last question for you. I know you got to get going. Uh, th there's a lot of sort of consternation and analysis about uh, Governor Tate Reeves and, and the influence he has in this debate and other debates at the Capitol. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he obviously served in, in your office for eight years before you, and um, I know he still has some relationships at the Capitol. He has his own ideas about uh, tax cuts, uh, about all, all number of things, but the tax cut is a, a big sort of driving point for him. Uh, what is your relationship like with the governor? Do y'all do y'all speak much? Is does he have much influence at the Capitol currently? And well, does, does every he have a say in this at all? Every every well, he doesn't get a vote, you know. But no, every every governor has a has a bu bigger bully pulpit than anybody else does. And then the speaker, or the lieutenant governor, he's a governor. First, second of all, he came out of the Senate. Now a lot of those people he left with are still in the Senate. And they're supporting this plan, so uh, I would think. Your plan. Uh, yeah, the plan of that. Well, it's a Senate plan. I did, I don't get a vote unless it's a tie. But so they're supporting the Senate plan, and I'm I'm hopeful that the governor. I, I he was on the floor the other day. We had a good visit about this, and I told him I was worried about the numbers and what our concerns were about making sure that this was sustainable and we didn't show up having to cut the medical school out or something to try to make the balance budget. And uh, we had a good conversation. He, he's not one to like commit immediately, that kind of thing. He likes to look, look at all of his cards, I think. I anticipate the governor will support, as you know, he reduced tax. He did away with a 3% tax rate on a gradual basis and the franchise tax over 10 years, of which we've only done four years. So the, the model we're using is the model the governor used. <laughs> So I, I would think and hope that he would be supportive of that. Clearly, it would be nice not to have any income taxes, but the reality of continuing to pay our teachers something that we can get our educated workforce up is a priority. He has said it's a priority for him in his uh, speech, State of the State, State of the Union speech. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that he will support whatever comes out of this negotiations between us. <clears throat> I think um, he hasn't had a lot of input. I know the speaker met with him and gave him their plan entirely. Uh, our plan, I think, was one of our senators sent to him. I think may have met with him. Um, so, I mean, he's getting information, and so he'll be able to say how he feels about it. Certainly, we're following the model the governor did before, so hopefully he'll be supportive. Sure. And the other thing, he's real good at numbers. He was a state treasurer and a banker. So... Um, projections would make, I would anticipate, make the governor nervous. Sure. Well, Governor, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure hearing a little bit more about your perspective on, on the, the fiscal financial uh, moment that Mississippi faces. Thank you so much for sharing oh, your happy, time I'm and your expertise with us. And, uh, just, uh, just appreciate it. You know, we consider the press to be the other three million people that can't sit in front of you. Oh. And that's important, I think, because what you hear, you're going to disseminate, and that's really important. There's a lot of people who have questions. They're all at work right now. They started at 6 or 7 this morning, and they'll read your material, and they just don't have the opportunity you have to sit down with somebody and say, why? So we respect that, and we look forward to a long relationship with you all. That, despite the fact that the governor this year tried to infect the entire Capitol press corps with COVID, uh, <laughs> thankfully that It was a happen. bad day. Yeah, it was, it was not bad. <laughs> All, all was well. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you, Adam. Time. I really appreciate your time today.
Yes, uh, Marshall, show your cartoon one more time for the cameras in the crowd. That's a play on the classic Delbert commercial, right? All right, thank you all for coming. Our next event will be March 3rd, um, 7.30 here at Basil's downtown with Von Gordon of the Winter Institute for Re Racial Reconciliation. Thank you.